but Dr. Davina Ruth Two Bears, who's a Dene Navajo, originally from Bird Springs, Arizona. She is currently a presidential postdoctoral fellow at Arizona State University in the School of Human Evolution and Social Change. Davina's current community-based research involves the old loop boarding school's reuse as a Japanese isolation center in 1943 during World War II. Thank you, Dr. Two Bears, for joining us today. Hello, Yat e Abene, She Davina Two Bears, Yena She Turichini Nishle, Hachini Vashishin, Tabahi Dashache, Do Turichini Dashanella, City Tote Nasha. Hello, I'm Davina Two Bears, and I am originally from Birch Springs, Arizona on the Navajo Reservation. And my plans are um, bitter water, and I am born for red running into the water. And my maternal grandfather is Edgewater, and my paternal grandfather is also bitter water. So thank you so much for having me. For many for many reasons, um, they are important because they may be um, sacred places or they're just really important places in Navajo history and to our families. And um, one of these places that I knew about um, is, is the Old Loop Boarding School site. And so that is a place where my grandparents told stories. Um, my maternal grandparents told me stories when I was a child about their experience at the Olu boarding school. And I, I just, you know, as a kid was just listening to them and, you know, my grandmother experienced uh, bullying at the Olu boarding school because um, she had these tattoos on her hands and her arms. And I asked her, you know, where she got those tattoos. And she said that when she was at the Olu boarding school, she was, um, forcefully tattooed by the older students, uh, the older girls, they would practice their tattooing skills on the children, little girls. And so they held her down and, and tattooed her. And so um, she also told me how she, she knew my grandfather and she would take care of him at this, at the school. She would look out for him. Um, she thought that he was related to her, but, um, He's actually not related to her um, through clans, but she still um, looked out for him at the old Luke boarding school because he was small for his age. I mean, I and my grandfather told me um, stories um, about how he used to, to go hunting around the school and they would kill, him and his friends would kill um, jackrabbits and they would cook them um, outside of the school grounds, out, you know, away from the school. And so the teachers wouldn't see them. But what's really remarkable in his story is that um, he, he was given a, a Christmas, um, at Christmas, he was given a toy gun and he was able to refashion that toy gun into an actual real gun. And that's what they used to go hunting around the school. And my mother said they did this because they were starving. The kids were very hungry. And this is a common theme in a lot of these boarding school stories is that the children did not get enough to eat in these uh, federal Indian boarding schools. So just a little bit about um, the theory and methodology of my dissertation of, you know, the reason um, I really wanted to research the Olu boarding school is because there was nothing written in the history books about the Olu boarding school. It is a federal Indian boarding school, but um, even though it existed on the Navajo reservation from like 1909 to 1942, there was no written history, especially no written history from a Navajo perspective about the school. And that's one of the reasons why I wanted to go back and get my PhD was because I want to research archeological sites because it is, the Old Loop Boarding School is a historical archeological site. 
that has never been in-depthly researched. And that's one of the reasons why I wanted to go back to school was to research places like this so that I can, you know, document my tribe's history and share it with not only the, the Dene Navajo people, but other, you know, Americans. And that is a very important aspect of decolonizing research. So that is the research that I'm doing. And I'm also focusing on survivance theory. So just not looking at how um, Native American indigenous peoples, um, you know, were the 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 sad story of of, of them suffering through federal Indian boarding schools um, curriculum of assimilation, but looking at those stories of survivance of how Native American children were able to overcome those assimilative policies in the early 20th century and you know hang on to their culture and identity and their language. So. As you may or may not know, there have there have been um, a lot of federal Indian boarding schools, both on and off the reservation. And this map shows uh, federal Indian boarding schools off the reservation, the most famous of which was, and the first one was Carlisle Indian School, which opened in the 1870s in Pennsylvania. That was the first uh, federal Indian boarding school that opened and served as a model for other federal Indian boarding schools. And um, Captain Richard Pratt was the one that um, had the idea of um, opening a federal Indian boarding school to assimilate Native American children. And he got this idea when he was stationed at Fort Marion in uh, Florida, where there were uh, Native American prisoners of war that he was overseeing at, at the prison. So these schools were very much uh, modeled on that uh, experience he had at that prison. And they were um, a very um, militaristic environment. And um, children were um, separated from their families from as young as, you know, age five and even younger, all the, all the way until they turned um, into adults. Um, they may or may not have been allowed to go home during the summer, but it. Um, they also had outing programs, they called them. So during the summer, um, children would work as laborers in farms or for farmers, or um, what girls would do housekeeping for um, white families. So they actually, some children didn't actually get to go home uh, for many years. And so, this definitely was detrimental for Native American children because we were away from our uh, communities, our families, our our culture, and our languages. And many um, that was the policy was to not allow children to speak their language, and they were severely punished if they if they did so. Now there is an organization that exists now, the National Native American Boarding School Healing Coalition, which you may have probably heard about already. They are researching boarding, Native American boarding school history. And they did so, um, I don't know when this organization began, but it, it's, it's been recent, but it did begin before um, Deb Holland's, um, the Secretary of the Interior's uh, agenda to research Native American boarding school history, and um, that that um, this this Na National Native American boarding school healing coalition was an initiative that began before Deb Holland was the secretary of appointed secretary of the Interior. So there is a lot of great information on this website and. They've collected information so far about 523 Indian boarding schools that existed across the United States. And of those, more than 400 were federally funded. So that's what you see here on this map of where all those schools were. And you can see the schools were basically pretty much in almost every state. Um, for the Navajo Nation, we had um, in 1868, signed a treaty with the um, United States and 
after being imprisoned at Fort Sumner, New Mexico for four years from 1864 to 1868, um, the Navajo people were finally released after they signed this treaty. And in this treaty, uh, the United States agreed to um, build a school for all children aged six to 16. But in reality, this did not occur into well into the um, late 20th century. So um, funding for boarding schools was very much limited. And that is the reason why boarding schools also could not provide, um, you know, a, a good education or, well, they, they were, they were only allowed to provide a vocational education, but even the basics, just like food, sanitation, health, um, you know, a warm place to, to go to school, all of these basics were not being met. And on the Navajo Nation, there was actually um, all of these um, federal Indian boarding schools that were um, built in the early 20th century, including at Loop, Arizona, which is in the southwest corner of the Navajo Nation. So it's about 45 miles uh, east of Flagstaff, Arizona, and also about 25 miles away from Winslow, Arizona. These are border towns that we call towns that are on the edge of the Navajo reservation. You may have heard of Flagstaff, Arizona. It's a very uh, beautiful mountain town there in Northern Arizona. So um, this map just depicts the Navajo reservation and where all of the federal Indian boarding schools were built on the Navajo reservation. This map depicts the um, Navajo, um, the old loop boarding school and I, found this map at the National Archives in Washington, DC. So much of the boarding school archival information is located in archives across the country, which is not online. So you physically have to go to these archives, search their records and uh, find the you know, actual pieces of paper from you know, the early 20th century that they have on file. And I went to three archives and that was in Washington, DC, Riverside, California, and Denver, Colorado, uh, National Archives to find information about the old loop boarding school. So this map was drawn in 1941 and it was in um, the National Archives in Washington, DC. And it is a map of the old loop boarding school campus right before it closed. So this central part of the map is the heart of the uh, boarding school, uh, old loop boarding school. This building here, um, I hope you can see my cursor, is the dormitory. And this central building was the original um, building that was constructed in 1908. And now this central building has an opening to the north and the south that is large enough for a truck to drive through. And in when it was first built, it was the school, the dormitory, the dining hall. It, it functioned, um, it served all of those needs. And that is uh, where the original um, the boarding that was the original boarding school at Loop in built in 1908, opened in 1909. Um, Joseph Maxwell was the first superintendent of the Loop uh, agency. So there were five agencies that reported directly to the Commissioner of Indian Affairs in Washington, D.C. on the Navajo Reservation, and Loop Agency was one of those. Um, agencies that um, Joseph Maxwell was superintendent for and accompanying boarding schools across the Navajo Nation there usually was built also a um, uh, usually there was also a church there and a hospital to serve the needs of the children as well as the uh, greater Navajo community and also a trading post usually existed so in Loop's case, the Presbyterian Church was located to the west here. You can see where it says Mission, and that was opened in 1912. 
And then the there was a hospital built at Loop, um, but it it uh, they didn't actually have a um, very large hospital. I think at first there was only it only had um, the ability to serve you know less than ten people or they, less than ten beds in the hospital. And there, then the trading posts, the trading posts, it opened at the same time as the school there, um, you know, in 19, 1909. Um, and the first trading post owner, he was actually half Navajo and half white. And he actually went to the, got his uh, degree from the Hamp Hampton Institute, um, which was a, a college that served. African Americans, um, Latino, and some Native Americans um, got their um, de college degrees there at Hampton Institute there on the, the East Coast region. Um, and so the, the, the original boarding school was a very large, impressive structure made of sandstone. And in the 1920s, there was a lot of renovation at the old loop boarding school they built a second story onto the original building from 1908. And that became the, the um, dormitory for both the boys and girls. And then they built a separate building, which what became the actual school building um, just south of the dormitory that was built in 1923. And then over here, um, also south of the dormitory, they built a dining hall as well in the early 1920s, which could accommodate feeding about 400 children. So before that time, the, the school was able to accommodate about 70 students. But after they built the new school building, the dining hall, and made the original building the dormitory, then the school was able to accommodate about 14, or I'm sorry, 400 students. And then they also built a new hospital in 1927 here, a much larger hospital. And um, one of the unfortunate things about Loop was that it was built in an active floodplain. It's adjacent to the Little Colorado River, which doesn't flow, you know, 365 days a year. It flows intermittently whenever there's a rainstorm or whenever there's, you know, a lot of snow. So um, the Little Colorado River actually used to flow uh, to the, I always get my directions mess, messed up, but it used to flow east of the school and north. Um, and that's why you see this gray area here, this, what they call a dike, and it was a eight foot high earthen berm or earthen dike that was built um, to stop the flood waters from getting into the school. Because especially in the 1920s, like right after they built, had all this new construction, the river channel was changing and it was beginning to flow um, south and west and then north instead of um, flowing east of the school and north. And the river channel was flowing like it kept flooding the school um, in, in the 1920s and 1930s. And so that was a major problem. And the difficulty there was, especially for Native American children, was because they had diseases that, 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 that were common in the early 20th century across the reservation, and that was tuberculosis and also trachoma, which was a very painful eye disease that could, if untreated, could cause blindness. And it was spread through, um, you know, un unsanitary conditions. And it, it's interesting that the loop, the sewer system at the loop was piping that went directly into the little Colorado River. And if it flooded, you can just imagine that the sewage would probably be backed up and it would be all over, you know, the floodwaters that are around the campus. And no doubt had a negative effect on the children's health. Um, and, and a lot of times the children were evacuated from, or, or they had not evacuated, they had to 
leave the the Olu boarding school and were placed at different boarding schools for several months while the the Olu um, boarding school was cleaned and dried out. So they they were sent to you know um, like Fort Apache, um, which is on the 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 White Mountain Apache Reservation, also you know to um, Tuba City Boarding School. So they were sent to other other boarding schools temporarily because of the flood issue. This is just an um, an overview that of a photo that was taken in the 1940s, and you can see uh, here is how close the Little Colorado River is um, to the west of the Olu Boarding School campus. So, like I was talking about, this was the original boarding school that was um, built in 1908 and opened in 1909, and the the loop is named after the commissioner of Indian affairs at that time, who was Francis Loop. And it is really, um, this building is not in keeping with Navajo cultural architecture, especially regarding the fact that Navajo homes are round. They're called hogans and they always have a door that's facing east. Whereas these buildings, the door faced north. And in Navajo culture, that that if you have a door that faces or any kind of opening that faces north, that is indicative of death. We only do, um, you know, when a person passes away, then that, that then um, the Hogan will have an, uh, uh, an opening to the north for, to allow the spirit to go on. So it was a very, I think um, at this time, many people were very much in, um, still had our Navajo culture and definitely our Navajo language. So psychologically to have, you know, doorways facing to the North, I think that would have been very hard on the parents and the students um, trying to, you know, who were living in, in this dorm. And because that's not in keeping with our culture whatsoever. Um, these photos I found at the National Archives and also, also this photo here was at the um, NAU Klein Library, Northern Arizona University in Flagstaff, Arizona. So the top photo, again, you can see how close the river is and this um, building in the background is the hospital and it's you can see the stilts that it was built on and how close the little Colorado River was flowing next to it. And then the, um, the school here building, like I said, built in um, 19, uh, I believe 1923. And then um, the back of that school had a long hallway and at the end of that hallway was an auditorium and that's where um, one of the elders I interviewed, Al uh, Alex Riggs said that they used to show movies for the children and he remembers watching Tarzan movies there. And my grandmother remembers watching uh, Mae West movies in that um, auditorium, little auditorium there. And her and her friends used to um, curl their long hair um, around the hot pipes on the radiators uh, because they wanted to mimic the look of Mae West. This is the dining hall. Um, these also all these, this photo I found in the Na National Archives. Again, this dining hall could accommodate feeding 400 students built in uh, the early 1920s. And this is an overview of the campus facing like North uh, West. And you can see the um, old dormitory here, which again was built in 1908. And then you can see the second story uh, that was added to this building. And then this building here was called the clubhouse. It had two stories and this is where many of the teachers used to live. And again, farther back in the photo, you can again see how the encroaching uh, flood waters of, of um, the little Colorado River. This whole school was powered by coal, and the coal was brought in by Navajo um, men on their uh, wagons 
with their horse and wagons who were hired to pick up the coal from the train station because the Santa Fe Railroad was about 18 miles away from Loop. And the there was a Sunshine train station about uh, 18 miles away that that is where uh, supplies were often picked up and coal. And they the ad administrators could send telegrams from the Sunshine train station. And um, so a lot of the archives, you can see a lot of the letters that were sent and also telegrams that were sent from that train stop. And this coal was burnt here in the powerhouse, which was on the northeast corner of the Loop Boarding School uh, campus. And um, this place provided the heat for the school. And it was a, also, uh, the students were also working in there. And when government inspectors came to the school, all loop in the early 20th century, and like, um, they were criticizing in the 1920s were criticizing the loop boarding school staff and telling them to not allow children to work in the powerhouse burning coal because it was a dangerous place. You know, they could get hurt. Um, and they they were criticizing the the administration and telling them to stop uh, stop having the children work in such a dangerous place. So this this I looked at the enrollment records at the National Archives. Um, I took photographs of them, and for my dissertation, I only looked at every four years to get a sense of how many Na um, Navajo children. And it was mostly Navajo children because we, you know, the, the school was on the Navajo reservation, but there were also other Native American children who were the children of the staff members that attended the school, such as Hopi um, and also some tribes like the Sioux tribe. And so a lot of these schools, they wanted to hire Native American staff because the white staff would leave the white staff didn't like the the water or they didn't like the environment because it is very much a, like a desert environment. Um, they didn't want their children. There was no school for their children and they didn't want them to go to the boarding school. So all, there was a high tur turnover rate. And one of the things that was really interesting was the letters written by the superintendent at Loop to other boarding schools like at Albuquerque Indian School, or even um, uh, boarding schools in Oklahoma, they're asking for quote unquote good Indian boys and good Indian girls who have graduated because they wanted to know if they could send them to Loop to work because the Native American staff tended to stay um, and did not just you know quit their job and and and. And, and go away. It was, it was, it was, um, you know, Native American people were able to um, tolerate, I guess, the isolation of, of working at Loop. But most of the teachers were all white. And, um, you know, the, the superintendent, of, of course, was white. And the, as you can see here, the attendance uh, greatly increased during that the 1924 to about, um, you know, 1929. And there was a huge flood in the early 1930s. And, and a lot of the students went just stopped coming to school after they had taken them away to um, other schools. They, they just actually never really came back after that point, after that huge flood in the early 1930s. And <clears throat> Um, one of the other things that, that I found on the enrollment records were the the earlier enrollment records from the night um, up into the 1920s. They all listed the names of the students. Unfortunately, the the enrollment records don't cover every year in the 1930s. They must have been lost or something. And they also don't write down the names like they used to in the 1930s. They just wrote down the numbers of boys and girls per grade. 
and their age, their ages, but they didn't write down the names, but the earlier records, they do write down the names and they do write down the kind of work each student was assigned to do for their vocational education. So it looks like the younger students, like under, you know, age 10, mostly, or probably like maybe age eight and under, they stayed in school all day. That's what they would write, school all day in next to their name. But the older kids, they had written down different jobs. So for the girls in 1922, for example, these were the kinds of jobs that the girls were doing for their vocational education, mending, dishwashing, laundry, kitchen, working in the kitchen, working in the sewing room, working in the sewing room and cottages. So you you have to remember that the kinds of the, the education that the, the federal government or federal Indian policy was to provide a education so that Native American children would go on to jobs as laborers, house housekeeping jobs, not they were not being educated to become scientists, lawyers, engineers, or go on to college. So they were just providing them with a vocational education to become laborers in a Western capitalistic society. <clears throat> And this, these are the kinds of the jobs that the boys were um, um, doing. They were working in the houses. They were working as carpenters, farming, hospital. The in the you can see here the boiler house, which, um, like I said, that the inspectors were criticizing Loop about not having children work in the powerhouse or boiler house. They were learning blacksmithing skills. They had a shoe shop, they had gardening and special, I don't know what special means. Um, one of the, the disturbing things that I found in these enrollment records was, was the fact that some of the children died at the boarding school. And I haven't really found any other information aside from the enrollment records. They would just write dead next to some of the children's names. And sometimes they would write the reason why they died, like died from tuberculosis or died from smallpox, but it was very disturbing to read that. And that, as we have, you know, recently learned, um, there's been a lot of focus on boarding schools within the past couple of years because of the fact that in Canada at the residential schools for um, First Nations children, which were like boarding schools, here in the US, they um, were finding unmarked graves associated with residential schools. And that just started this whole media frenzy about residential schools in Canada. And also it trickled into the focus on you boarding schools here in the United States and the history of boarding schools. And this is something that I've been waiting, you know, desperately for, you know, I many Native Americans, we know about this history. It's affected our families. There's, you know, the fact that I don't speak Navajo is because, you know, of this boarding school, this um, Indian policy of, of, you know, not allowing children to speak their language and, and the, the effects can be felt generations to this day. And so um, I've been, waiting and just really so happy finally there is attention and that's why I'm invited here today to speak about the history of boarding schools and I'm thankful for that because this history has been a silence history and I think it's really important that we give marginalized groups a voice and that all we learn about all the histories of the United States you know, and so it's, I'm so thankful that we're finally, that people are having an interest in what actually went on to Native Americans and the boarding school history and, you know, how it affected us. But um, this is a picture of how it looks out there 
facing west, you can see the Navajo Sacred Mountain, the San Francisco Peaks. It's a sacred mountain to the Navajo. It is, it is a very important sacred place. It is a part of who we are, our 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 worldview, our it, our I guess you would say our religion. We still it's part of all of our ceremonies that we practice still to this day. And you can see the um, eight foot high dike there on the right of the photo, and that a little bit it just so shows you how high it it went. And this is a picture of the Little Colorado River today. This is the bridge that was built in the early 1920s. And the one, the bridge that the children would probably, the, the, the elders said they had to walk across when it was flooding so that they could get onto a bus and go to a different school. This is a picture of some of the elders that I interviewed and my giving a talk at the Loop Chapter House. I still needed to still need to give a talk about my research at the Bird Springs Chapter House, which is the next local um, uh, community next to the old loop boarding school, and that's where I'm from. Um, the pandemic uh, ruined my plans of, of giving a talk there, and um, but what one of the stories, like I said, um, the the elders uh, Alex Riggs. He told about um, stories of survivance and and also stories of kinship, and he told about you know how he was taken care of by an older girl at Old Loop because the young the 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 boys would take the food from the little kids. They would um, in the cafeteria when the 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 teacher or the disciplinarian they called them was were not around or on the other side of the room, then the bigger boys would take the food of from the little boys. And there was an older girl who actually used to physically fight with the older boys to keep them away from him, Alex, so that he could eat his food because he was so small. And he, he and so this just shows you, you know, how they're, they're that the the older students often would take care of the younger students. And um, also regarding kinship, there's a stor stories told by two sisters, um, Hope Harrison and Lynn Lucinda Machen about their grandparents. And their grandparents would come to the Old Loop boarding school and they would park on, like I said, that dike that was on the eastern side of the school campus, they would park on the other side of that dike out of surveillance of the boarding school staff, and they would tell their grandkids to come, granddaughters to come, and they would feed them traditional Navajo foods like mutton, and they also had cornfields, and they would bring uh, uh, watermelon. And they also would donate uh, sheep and watermelon and corn from their cornfields to the Old Loop boarding school as well. So this is important in, in it shows that grandparents still were a, still um, visited, even though they weren't able to take their grandkids, granddaughters away from away from school, they took it upon themselves to visit their granddaughters at the Old Loop boarding school and also um, donated food to the school because of that strong, um, what we call eh, is our relation, our, our relationships with our relatives and not only having good relationships of love with our relatives and respect and also, you know, our relatives are our knowledge keepers and they're the teachers of the younger generation. So they took it upon themselves to keep that relationship going despite the fact that their children, their granddaughters were not allowed to leave the school. And one of the stories of uh, survivance that Arda Curley talks about, just like my grandfather, she was not sitting idly by to you know, she was starving, her, her friends were starving, and they would sneak out at night and steal bread from the bread maker's house. And they also 
um, she told me that the matrons who were hired to watch over the children in the dormitories would pour the fruit that were meant for the children. So they wouldn't give them the peaches, apples, and oranges. And so Ardeth and her friends would go out at night and steal the fruit back from the matrons in and in, in, you know, go into their residences and steal the fruit and give it, give it, redistribute it back out to the kids. So to me, these are, you know, stories of survivance. They show the resiliency of the children and and how they did not just sit idly by and take the abuse, but they in their own small way fought back, you know, to um, get enough to eat. And also a lot of these stories, the language, Navajo language was being suppressed and the children, even though they were punished, you know, um, Lucinda Machen talks about how she, and many Native Americans boarding school stories talk about how they were forced to eat soap when they spoke their language and, or they, Ardeth also talks about how she was meant, she had to kneel on a broom stick for hours when she spoke Navajo, but this did not deter them from speaking their Navajo language. They kept speaking Navajo. Uh, Ardeth tells a story about how they would speak Navajo in the classroom when the teacher wasn't there and they would have a lookout. And if if they saw the teacher coming back, then the the lookout person would say, she's coming, she's coming. And then they would stop speaking the Navajo language. So they would continue to speak the language just out of earshot of the um, teachers and disciplinarians. However, ironically, there was, you know, a space where they could speak Navajo, which I, this is one of the really surprising things that I found out in my research that at Loop, as you can see here, the elders, Ardeth and Hope Harrison, were telling me that they were learning to weave at the Loop boarding school. And I was like, you mean you were learning to weave Navajo rugs? And they're like, yes, we learned the whole process. We learned everything from spinning the wool, dyeing the wool, weaving the wool. And I was like, I, you know, you don't hear that about really about boarding school history, but what happened was that in the night in 1928, the Brookings Institute did this large study of American, a Native American and United States treatment of um, Native American people and the government and how all these governmental programs were working, including boarding schools, and they wrote a scathing report about how children were uh, basically malnourished, unhealthy, you know, there was, they're not receiving a, a good education, there's not enough funding in these federal Indian boarding schools, there's a harsh militaristic environment, and all of these, you know, negative things about the federal in, Indian boarding schools that are funded by the government, and so this really instigated the overall change in um, Indian educational policy to where they started to include aspects of the culture, which um, they call safe, such as women's culture, women's art, and that included the uh, skill of weaving Navajo rugs. So this was, this is, was allowed and um, the elders were telling me this, and I, I just couldn't believe it. And then um, I went to the Na or the Navajo Nation archives in Window Rock, Arizona at the Navajo Nation Museum, which by the way, you should visit if you ever go to the Navajo Nation, it's a wonderful museum. And there in the archives, I found these beautiful photographs taken by a government photographer, Milton Snow, who went to a lot of the schools on the reservation in the early 20th century and photographed the schools and the students. And I saw these pictures that you see here of children at Loop learning how to weave. And the 
the elders didn't really remember that they didn't remember the white teacher's name except for Alex Riggs he was the only one that remembered his white teacher the names but the Navajo um, women that I interviewed they the only name that they remembered was uh, uh, Miss Martin and because she was the the Navajo weaving teacher and she was Navajo and she in this space she spoke to the students in the Navajo language. So this was um, one space at the boarding school where the, 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 the girls, they would not be punished for speaking the Navajo language and they were learning how to weave, which is a very important, um, it is a very, um, you know, to this day, a, a, a important Navajo uh, culture, cult, cultural craft, that many women and even some some men practice to this day. So my grandmother, my great grandmother, were weavers as well, but um, they they didn't teach my sisters and I how to weave. Um, my grandmother was going to, but she passed away when I was twelve years old. So um, I think I'm running out of time, but. Um, a lot of the teachers at Loop, they incorporated the flora and fauna of the area of Loop. And so you see here porcupine and porcupines were very much present at Loop. There's a lot of cottonwood trees that used to grow along the Little Colorado River, but now the invasive species of tamarisk has taken over and killed a lot of the cottonwood trees and willow trees. But back in the early 20th century, they did have porcupines. And again, my current research is looking at the Olu boarding school uh, history's use as a uh, Japanese isolation center during 1943, during World War II. And it was reused to imprison about 70 Japanese American men in 1943 for about nine months. So this history has been researched by Japanese Americans and the National Park Service, um, a film that was re recently produced in 2016, I believe, A Better Legacy by Claudia Katianagi talks about the Loop Isolation Center. And, but it hasn't been researched from a Navajo perspective. And um, so that's what my current research is doing. These are just photos of how um, the Loop uh, historical site looks now. There's only two remaining buildings that are on campus. They're both houses, and the reason why they are still there was because Navajo families moved into them. And in 1966, according to one of the elders, the Bureau of Indian Affairs came in and bulldozed all of the historical buildings to it's like flattened the, the whole boarding school campus. So there's nothing out there except a bunch of rubble. And like, you can see the foundations of some of the buildings and you can see this big rubble mound here on the, the left photo. And way in the back, you can see the eight foot high dike on the photo on the left. Um, you can see segments of sidewalks. The sidewalk is in front of the old hospital. And this is what the trading posts used to look like. And it did close in the 1980s. So it was open for a very long time from, you know, um, I think 1910 to, to the 1980s. And then on the photo on the right is how it looks now because it was also demolished. There's a lot of these features on the ground, these, you know, um, you know, having to do with probably the water and sewage. So I just want to say thank you to everyone. And I think it went over my time, but maybe we have some time for a few questions. So yeah, thank you. All right, thank you so much, um, Dr. Davina Tuberes. That was really, really lovely. Those stories of survivance, I think, are something that um, just make these things so personal. And I think it's one thing to learn like the bigger picture, but when we see these stories of actual people, when we see the photographs, I think it like, it really humanizes this for us. And I'm really excited because we've had, they, we had that one image of the kids on, on the playground as the image that's on the flyers everywhere. So it's really fun to have that kind of brought back into the talk today for us to, to learn more about that. 
And so my, one of my questions was for you, what's, what's next with your research here? And as an archeologist, what do you do with a space like this that no longer has these buildings and yeah, what's next for your, for your research and for you? Yeah, I, we recently, um, I'm working with some colleagues, uh, Jun Sinsiri from Berkeley and uh, Koji Lao Ozawa, who is at UCLA and just graduated from Stanford. And he, Koji, researched the Gila River Indian um, Japanese uh, incarceration camp. And his uh, grandparents were incarcerated there during World War II. So I'm working with um, both June and Koji, and we hope to actually map the loop site because it hasn't been mapped as an archaeological site. And part of doing um, decolonizing research as well is to do non-invasive research. So we want to do surface analysis of the historical artifacts and map the site and get it uh, a site number. And we did receive funding recently. So we hope to get out in the field this summer and to do that. So we'll finally be able to um, do some, you know, investigation of this historical site. And also in collaboration with the loop community, we want to have community days at the site so that we can talk to um, the loop community community about its history and what we're learning and hopefully they can share what they also know about the site and invite also Japanese descendants who have an interest in loop or may have had their relatives in, in prison there to these community days as well and um, we would we would like to uh, produce some kind of learning uh, curriculum or products, um, whether it be in the form of um, a website or um, some other kind of uh, technology, which which my colleagues have more experience with. I, I'm I'm not that technologically savvy, but um, my friend June, he's he's had some experience with working with um, like mobile apps and. Um, possibly uh, using an app to, uh, as you walk around the site, you can learn more about it. So he he's had experience in that kind of technology, but we, you know, it's important that we do this in collaboration with um, the adjacent communities of Loop and um, my community, Bird Springs, which is like the, the boarding school is like, right, this, this, the, dividing line between the Loop community and Bird Springs is right on the boarding school campus. And so um, that's why a lot of um, Navajo children from Bird Springs and Loop went to school there, as well as some other communities that are also close by. So so those are some of the plans that we have. So it is, it'll be really exciting to get out in the field and and finally get to do some field work out here. But like I said, again, you know, we're we're doing this um, with the community, the communities. We did get consent from the uh, or supporting resolutions from the Loop chapter and the Bird Springs chapter, and um, so you know. Uh, but but we also would like to work with um, schools in the area um, to see what what they're interested in as well in learning about Loop. Thank you so much. That's absolutely fascinating. We will definitely stay tuned to see kind of what comes out and what things are, are produced. Thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, yes. Yes. Yeah. Did, did they have looms and neck rugs before they went to the boarding school? Or was that okay. So he's asking about weaving and were they making rugs and using the weaving before boarding school? Yeah, actually, Ardeth Curley said she already knew how to weave before she went to boarding school because her mother taught her to weave. And so um, when she got to boarding school, the teacher, Ms. Ms. Mar Mrs. Martin, asked Ardeth to help her teach the other girls how to weave. So Ardeth said since she already knew how to weave, she would help the other girls, the young children, uh, learn 
um, she would help them and she would help teach uh, them how to weave. So yeah, so some of them did already learn how to weave. And um, Hope Harrison said she was just about to get to learn how to weave when they closed the school down in 1942. And her sister Lucinda Machen said that she actually did weave a rug and um, she finished it and she took it to the trading post because that's where a lot of the Navajo uh, women would take their rugs are to these trading posts on the reservation or in the border towns to sell them. And um, she said she only got $2 for her rug. Right. And she was really mad about that. And she, because she worked so hard and that's, that's what happened to a lot of Navajo weavers. So she learned that at a very young age that, you know, it, it wasn't worth it basically is what she said. She was like, I, I, never again, I'm not doing this <laughs> again. I didn't, you know, they didn't pay me enough. Oh, so long. Any other questions today? Yes. Um, what kind of challenges did she face through academic institutions um, in her archive? Okay, um, so this is from an audience member. What, sorry, can you say, what challenges did you face with your own research in this academic journey, archivally and on the field and all, all of the things? Is yeah. that, okay, sorry. I hope I paraphrase that no, correctly. Yeah, exactly. yeah, come on over, yes. Challenges. Hi, thank you so much. <laughs> Yeah, um, you're welcome. What kind of challenges were faced going through academic institutions being rooted in colonization and white supremacy? Um, what kind of challenges were faced in your archival journey? Um, I think, you know, it, I think what uh, the, the amount of um, information I, so when I went to these archives, what I did is I took photographs of pretty much everything. Um, <laughs> yes, I understand, yeah. What was really challenging for me is, and still is to this day, is to how to like electronically, you know, handle all this information. Um, and I haven't even read through all of it either because there's just so much information I I haven't even read through all of the information and um, it's, I guess it's data that needs to be managed. And that's a challenge for me. Another challenge that, you know, I, I realize um, the importance of institutional review boards and the Navajo Nation also has an institutional review board. They're called the Navajo Nation Human Research Review Board. But it was also challenging for me to get permission because you have to get permission from the Navajo Nation Institutional Review Board for your research before you can you know, go out onto the reservation. And it requires supporting resolutions from the chapter houses. It requires a permit from the Navajo Nation Historic Preservation Department. And also it requires that you get approval also from your institution. So your institution's institutional review board, and you have to put all of this into one packet. And it was really difficult sometimes because I was living in Indiana, going to school at Indiana University in Bloomington, Indiana, and I would come home during the summers. And sometimes when I would go to the chapter meetings, which only happen once a month, um, I would have two chances because I'd you know, be only be able to go home for two months to go to the chapter meetings. And if they don't meet quorum, they don't have a meeting and they won't be able to pass a, you know, any resolution. They won't be able to conduct business. So some, you know, I, I, I would attend these chapter meetings and they wouldn't be able to approve my research because they didn't meet quorum. So that would affect my timeline for doing my research. I mean, I understand you know, the reason why there, uh, um, the Navajo Nation government reviews research on the reservation because, you know, a lot of research that has been done is to the detriment of the Navajo people and not to their benefit. And so, um, but also it's a very time consuming process. And, and I think that, you know, that I guess, 
you could say that is an an arm of you know the bureaucracy that is created you know as but but it's also you know the reason why there's this bureaucracy is because there has been harm by re researchers have harmed native american indigenous peoples in the past and that's why these you know the, and the Navajo Nation Institutional Review Board is very thorough in in granting um, an individual, even a Navajo researcher. So they don't they don't cut you any slack if you're Navajo. You still have to go through the same process as everyone else. So it's you know it's a good thing, but also it's also I don't know. Um, it can be frustrating. <laughs> I think um, institutional review boards are always like slightly frustrating because I can't imagine having to go through two different processes that have two different rules and everything. So that, that is a lot. And I think uh, for those of us who are hist historians in here doing dissertation research, it's a blessing and a curse, right? When there's so much information out there. I mean, it's wonderful, but it's also overwhelming, I'm sure, to have so much information as well and to process it and Yes, and but that means that you will never be at an end of projects to be doing as you continue to go on with this research. There's there's so much still to uncover. So that is that's absolutely fabulous. And we cannot wait to see all the things that you're able to to do with this. And thank you so much for coming and speaking to us today. Yes, Martina has a question. Yeah. Are there graves at Old Loop and are they doing research on those out there? Um, there, there is a cemetery at Old Loop, but um, I did walk through it and the earliest um, headstones date to the 1960s. So mm. my, I haven't, like I said, I haven't found information um, regarding the deaths of the children other than on the enrollment records. Um, there could be other records in archives, like for the Indian Health Service, which um, they they also have archival records, but I haven't researched their records. And perhaps that's where the information is about how, because I haven't even been able to find like what the process was or how like like letters, for example, from the school informing the parents that their child passed away or what like the process was or anything like that there I haven't found essentially I haven't found anything other than what was written on the enrollment records and so um at this point um you know there I I don't know like where I I'm I'm you know, per perhaps when we record the site during field work, um, maybe we might encounter something like that. But I don't. I at this point, I don't know. The the um, I think um, there was there there was um, an Indian uh, cemetery in Winslow, Arizona, where a lot of the Native Americans were buried. Um, and there was an Indian hospital, Indian Health Service hospital in Winslow, Arizona as well. And um, one of, um, there was an article on some archeologists re that were doing studies on that uh, Indian burial ground. And one of the things that I think they said was that um, some of the burials might have been from um, children who were in boarding schools. So I'm assuming that included loop. But other than that small amount of information, I I don't know about what happened to the children um, that I found on the enrollment records that passed away there. Oh, thank you. My goodness. Yes. Well, hopefully more information can come out with further archaeological research that you're going to be conducting. And it's really just lovely hearing from a professional like you who actually is going out and doing the, the work out there. 
And thank you so much for taking your time to come and speak with us today. We are absolutely honored to hear more about Old Loop and hear these stories of survivance. I, I really enjoyed hearing those personal stories. It adds such a really lovely touch to this. And thank you so much. And if you are attending this for extra credit, make sure to fill out that form that's in the chat. And please come by and see the exhibit before it leaves us at the end of the month. Thank you so much, everybody. And we hope you have a great day. Bye for now.